with a special treat for you if you're interested in adventure. Just 132 people in the world have trekked to the North Pole. But tomorrow, two Irish people set off to be the first Irish people to add their names to that list. It's a pleasure to welcome to the studio adventurers Mike O'Shea from Kerry and Dr Claire O'Leary from Cork. They'll leave for Canada tomorrow where they'll be deposited and they will begin a 778, almost 800 kilometre trek in temperatures that will reach minus 55 degrees. All this will be done as they drag a sled behind them um, weighing 80 kilograms. As part of their preparations they spent last night in a freezer. I thought I I was suffering storm damage. Now, it's a pleasure to welcome Mike and Claire to the studio. Uh, We'll talk about the trip itself but, but Claire, you've done a fair amount of climbing and trekking before. Tell us some of your most harem scarum adventures to date. Um, I suppose the biggest one was Everest. That's about 10 years ago. Um, I was the first Irish female to summit Everest and then I went on to climb the seven summits, which is the highest mountain on each of the seven continents. Uh, I skied to the South Pole and skied across Greenland. And as part of the ice project, we've crossed the North Patagonia ice cap and last year skied the length of Lake Baikal in Siberia. Tell us about the ice project. Uh, so it's planned to co- cross most of the uh, the biggest polar regions in the world. So that includes the Arctic Ocean, uh, which is the, the North Pole trip that we're heading off on tomorrow. There's a kind of checklist of all of them that you do, is it? Yeah, yeah. We just made a plan uh, so that we had plans for adventure for the next few years. So we've been kind of working through them for the last two years. Now, Mike, match that. <laughs> I'm from Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I suppose, uh, yeah, I've been about 30 years just doing, you know, general climbing and adventure from, you know, Ireland to Scotland, the Alps, to the Himalayas. Um, and, you know, done a lot of stuff. Very involved in the Irish Coast Guard, involved in the team in Dingle um, for a long number of years and Kerry Mountain Rescue before that. And do a lot of paramotoring and paragliding and stuff like that. So I've, we I do a very different kind of range of adventures to Clare. But the last, I suppose, the last three or four years, yeah, we've kind of joined up and, and made an attempt at the North Pole in 2012 and, and done the rest of those trips as well. European Alps? Yeah, all over the Alps, yeah, yeah. I think that's, you know, it's a natural kind of climbing ground for lots of Irish people. So we've been going to places like Chamonix in France and stuff like that, at Mont Blanc and stuff, doing climbing there and spending, you know, six weeks in the summertime climbing there, you know. And your, your K2 attempt in 93, that, that went all the way, did it? No, we didn't. No. But there was two people summited on that trip, um, but I didn't. I wasn't one of the summer team, no. OK. And you won a Gold Gashka Award? Yes, that's many years ago, 1991. Right. <laughs> yeah. OK, and just tell us about Life Proof. Yeah, so basically, um, I suppose this trip came up at very short notice. The problem with the North Pole is that the ice has been so broken there the last number of years. And we um, we only heard four weeks ago that the ice was going to be good to go this year. The ice has been so poor there for the last number of years that, you know, it's very difficult to get a weather window that's going to be suit. So everything's kind of lined up for this year. So basically four weeks ago, we found out that we were going to get a chance to go. And at that stage, we started using the, the, the Twitter machine to see what we could get. And, and LifeProof uh, reached out to us within two days on Twitter. And we teamed up with them. So LifeProof are, are based out of Cork, but they, they for their Irish operation, and they do um, waterproof cases and stuff like that. And part of it of for, the for tablets was tablets and smartphones. Yeah, for that's tablets and smartphones. Make. Part of the and they're for us sponsoring the whole project. They're are they? giving. They're coming on as the headline sponsor. We still we still need other funds. We have had other people helping us from SAS watches down in Wicklow. It's an Irish watch manufacturer to Sergus Energy. Uh, the Great Outdoors, which we're doing a talk in tonight. So we've had lots, and lots of private individuals have come in behind us. Lots of people are interested in this and giving us the help because th- it's such an expensive trip. You know, most other trips are, are a fraction of the cost of this trip. What, you know? what is the cost? Completely without us getting any support with other teams or sharing logistics, we could be up to €250,000. We're going to get into the specifics of the trip in yeah. a second, but you, look, you've both done a huge amount of things. Mike, you mentioned K2. Um, you know the 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 lengths of my climbing is Karen Hill, but you mentioned K two a huge achievement, the climbers mountain they call it. Yeah. We we've lost people on it, including Jer McDonald, who I'm yeah. sure both of you um, know or have certainly come across in in careers like your own or in adventures like your own. Putting your own safety in there, Claire as well. Everest, the amount of people who have been lost on Everest, does that come into it, or is it simply the adventurer thing of we have to climb it? It's there. 
I, I, yeah, I don't think it's like that. I think, I mean, look, anyone who goes to these mountains, they go with, you know, a, a huge amount of preparation. And I suppose we all go with this invincible thing that we're all invincible in, in our own way. But I suppose, look, it's circumstances are going to change in those things. You I mean, all the planning and all the preparation in the world, you know, you can't, you can't prepare for everything. So it's really down to, a lot of it's down to experience and stuff. And doing the training, in advance of these trips, like we've done a massive amount of training for the North Pole and prepared with swimming in icy water to pulling our sleds to doing like the likes of Lake Baikal. So it's building up that range of experience that makes you, you know, able to make decisions when things change. You know, t- circumstances are going to change very fast. And when circumstances change, you have to be able to react to them, you know. Will swimming be part of it or is that just in case no, the ice cracks or is that you to, have to, to take it, a shortcut? It's, basically? Par- it's part of it, really, because yeah. we get what well, a thing called leads, which is where, the, you know, the ice does two things. It either gets pushed in itself and it crushes or else it separates. And when it separates, we get ice leads so you know sometimes those ice leads could be 5 miles 10 miles wide yeah. last year there was one ran for over 1200 kilometres one of these leads for 1200 kilometres long you can't walk around it so, so you have, you to, have swim to swim across you know? so we have special suits that we got from Norway um, manufactured for that so we have those and we're going to use those Claire Ivan mentioned that you had slept in a freezer uh, it was the night before last wasn't it yeah. so first of all where's this freezer somewhere in Dublin uh, you, it was out in Swords um, so yeah it's a big uh, commercial freezer so we went in and spent the night we, we've got some new equipment since we were up in the on the last North Pole trip um, so we started to test that because in the cold things don't work the same as they do at home you know everything breaks and everything just reacts differently so yeah we got to test a lot of our so you're your setting up, up your, your tent your sleeping bag your, your clothing your gear your underlayer your overlayer and actually yeah. practice and sleeping how cold was the freezer it was minus 24 um, but it was, yeah it was certainly it felt even colder than it would outside because always outside you have a bit of sunlight and it just brings the temperature down that yeah. little bit um, but yeah out there it was it was seriously but, uh, cold would your, would your nose end up like Fergie's nose like would how do you, do you are you covered head to toe in, in, in thermals yeah yeah so we're fully covered um, on our uh, heads and faces balaclavas goggles uh, there's nothing exposed because it's just it's so easy to get frostbite or, or cold any sort of cold injury and would the there. numbness get into your fingers oh yeah uh, almost you know any time so the cold when you're moving you can generate heat and you're fairly comfortable when you're moving and pulling a sled because you're using a lot of energy and creating a lot of heat but it, stopping for us to stop and get something to eat or did stop you, did you sleep in it did you oh, yeah. fall asleep yeah. or do you oh, stay awake? Oh, yeah, 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 you sleep, yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's going to be cooler than that, though, up there, isn't it? So you went to minus 24 two nights ago. How, yeah. how cold will it get? So it's actually been a little bit warmer up there this year than it was, than it usually is. But the, two years ago when we were up there, it was minus 55 when we were flown in. So wow. seriously cold. Is there a difference between minus 24 and minus 55 or is it all oh, just unreal. damn cold? Unreal, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unreal. Yeah. Um, and what, would you, would, you know, when you're on a frosty day here, you exhale and you can see the cloud of uh, 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 sort of steam. Yeah. What's it like in terms of that? Would, would your... Say if you had a drip on your nose, would it actually freeze? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Even our would your breath freeze? Uh, so your I, my Saliva? eyelashes freeze. So you know my eyes close because the uh, the frost on my eyelashes just uh, yeah it makes them stick together. Yeah. Um, yeah. The wind is another issue. You're going to face the type of wind that Ireland had yesterday. Yeah, you get wind up there. Uh, to be honest with you, with that cold, so minus 55, if the winds pick up too much, we can't go out on it because the wind chill factor is so high that you would get a, a cold injury really quickly. So, you know, the winds, we have to look at how much wind is there and make an assessment in the morning whether we can even move in the wind or not because it's just so cold. Like the minus 55 thing, you're, you know, your breath and stuff like that, I mean, you just end up covered in frost and, you know, you get your icicles and like Claire says, your, your eyelashes, one of the things we have to do like every 20 minutes or half an hour is actually break the ice off our eyelashes because our eyes end up starting to close. Mm. So talk us through the timetable you, you you fly to Canada tomorrow so we fly we leave from here to Ottawa uh, we spend about two days in Ottawa just doing some final shopping and stuff like that rather than transporting everything out by plane we try and we're getting some stuff um out in Ottawa so we're flying out there with the support of 747 travel inside in town uh, from Ottawa we head up to Iqaluit which is, is the kind of the capital of the Inuit people um, we spend about a week there and we're going to do some pretty hard skiing up there it's a good training ground up there it's kind of around minus 35 minus 40 there so it kind of gets us used to, we just got to acclimatise to the cold because obviously coming from here is quite warm so you know it just takes days to get your body used to it and your body starts adjusting to the cold a bit better you know because like minus 30 is cold minus 40 you know, it's ast- it's not it's not like it's an extra ten degrees. It's almost like it feels like it doubles. Okay. When you go to minus fifty, it's just off the Richter scale. You know, of cold, like you know, you can't stop for a second. You know, so, that's so when does the trek start? So the trek starts the first week in March. So we're going to fly from Iqaluit up to a place called Resolute. 
we base ourselves in Resolute for a couple of days. It's just a small town with about 200 people in it. Um, it's like a kind of an outpost. Spend a few days there uh, just waiting. And then once the, once there's enough sunlight at the moment, it's 20, it, it's 24 hours dar- darkness up there. And it's just starting to change. So the Resolute just got the sun the other day, the first sign of the sun. So once there's enough light to fly us in, so they need roughly about three to four hours of twilight to get us on to the ice. So once that is in position, which looks around sometime in the first week in March and we get the weather window, we fly onto the ice. Claire, you have tried this before and conditions turned on you. Yeah, it wasn't so much conditions. We all up, Flights up here are all charter flights, so they cost a small fortune. So when we were going up um, in 2012, we had planned to share our flights with an Indian team. Um, but they ended up after we went on the ice they ended up having to pull out because of problems with some of their gear arriving and oh, so I see. on so, so if you had continued you would have had no extraction is that is that exactly, it you, yeah. you would have went too far so that was dangerous but if if we continued then yeah so the further you move away from Canada the more costly the flight is to pick you up so so have you got all of that planned because you, you know you're, you're, t- you're explaining to us that it's GPS you'll, you'll hopefully do it you'll get to the North Pole and then what you don't have yeah. to walk back to you no so we <laughs> so this year we've gone after the trip completely different way and we've changed a lot of equipment we're trying to stack it in our favor and the reason we have to stack it in our favor is because the conditions up there have changed dramatically and that's affecting when the flights go in and go out so traditionally you could have had 55 to 58 days to do this trip we're down to about 48 to 50 days so we've lost like 15 percent of the actual time on the ice which is huge like for us Mm. like that's probably you know that's probably 100 miles that we have to make up in that in that time frame so what we're trying to do at the minute is we're going as a supported expedition so that means we're going to get food dropped to us on the expedition so we can make the time up and at the moment we're trying to get the last flight in place so we've got enough we've got everything in place to do the trip are you going with a wider group or just the two of you? just the two of us right and, and planes will come over every few days and drop your food no it's on. about yeah. every t- every month every s- kind of three weeks so what we're trying to do at the minute is get that extra flight in place the extra flight will increase our chances of making it by about 30 to 40 percent okay we have enough money in place to do it if conditions are good and it rolls with us we're strong enough we're fit enough we've got the best equipment out there we can do the trip it's just if we get any cut in the weather and stuff like that that extra flight just if people want to follow your progress how can they do so yeah so we've got uh, the website is theiceproject.org on twitter it's at iceproj I-C-E-P-R-O-J and we're on Facebook as well and uh, tonight, tonight you have a, a fundraiser, eight o'clock in Chatham Street. That's uh, correct. Yeah, the uh, Great Outdoors. The Great Outdoors. Um, that's to give you a bit of a send off. Yeah. And there's tickets to go for that. Y- your sponsors are Life Proof, and you- you've had individual things sponsored. Yeah, we've as had well. a huge amount of individuals, like like I was saying there, like SAS watches came on board, and a, a kind of a quick thank you to Sherry and Malloy as well for giving us the use of their freezer. It's an unusual request, <laughs> and I think they they thought I was joking when I rang them first. Um, so there's them, Sergus Energy who run some wind farms down in Kerry and around the country and yeah we've had great people Life Proof have been fantastic they've become in they've obviously come in as a headline sponsor they've been absolutely fantastic they really really worked hard with us and what's great about that is that we were using their products anyway so I was using their products because it's the best that's out there and we moved on from there you know How do you stay in touch? We mentioned Twitter and Facebook and all that but more importantly if you need help or if you need you know whatever it is you need do you have satellite There's phones no out mo- there? There's no mobile coverage There's there? no mobile coverage no. <laughs> We have two satellite phones uh, we've got two satellite phones we carry one satellite phone each and that's so one one, we've got a backup phone, but also in case we get separated at any point up there, we, you know, we have two satellite phones so we can talk to each other or we can ring back to base. And we carry an EPIRB as well. Um, so we carry a personal location oh tracker. Right, so you'll yeah. have GPS, they'll know so where we, you are. Yeah, so we can, yeah. So every day we we ring back in to our team, to our, to Kean at base and uh, here in Ireland, and uh, he'll update everybody from there. Okay, well, look, guys, uh, absolute good luck and stay safe. More than anything, you both have a history of, of staying safe and known uh, about your safety. So uh, fingers crossed. Uh, we hope to talk to you, if not while you're out there certainly uh, after you succeed uh, good luck with it and safe travels Michael Shea and Dr Claire O'Leary uh, both adventurers as you can hear there and what they have planned is quite something hopefully uh, number 133 and 134 to uh, trek to the North Pole our very best wishes to you on for a safe return